So, like I said, the topic for today is on the lower practice and emotion focused therapy. My colleague Tony, Tony Rumanera and I have had the incredible luxury of working with a lot of people we personally like and professionally admire over the last few years in developing this book series for the American Psychological Association. And this is a book series called The Essentials of Deliberate Practice. And it's a skill building book series where each exercise, each book has 12 skill building exercises for different therapy models. And you can see we've already covered a number of therapy models so far. We keep churning out more of these books and it's just a wonderful luxury to be able to work <laughs> with all of these people across different therapy models. Uh, to those of you with a more integrative bend, it's a wonderful way to go beyond your own kind of modality and start taking a few inspirations from other therapy models. And I'm always very happy to say that the first book in this series was with our very own dear Rhonda Goldman on <laughs> the practice in emotion-focused therapy. So she really, I, I would say she did the extra work of starting from scratch in how to yeah. develop these exercises, test them out all over the world. And so mm -hmm. everyone's work was cut out after that. So, mm -hmm. so thank you so much, Rhonda. And I'm just very briefly going to present our guest expert for today. So Rhonda is a professor uh, at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology and the president of Emotion Focused Therapy Chicago. She also conducts trainings all over the world. Like she mentioned before, <laughs> she's just coming from calls <laughs> from many other points of the world today. Mm -hmm. She has authored or edited multiple books, including the Clinical Handbook of Emotion Focused Therapy, Case Formulation in Emotion Focused Therapy, and Emotion Focused Couples Therapy. And she is a founding board member of the International Society for Emotion Focused Therapy, which, by the way, will have its world conference in my own country of Portugal, in Porto, mm -hmm. this June. So I look forward to seeing all the EFT people in Portugal soon as well. Welcome, Rhonda. Hi. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> So I always like to start off with this question. Uh, Ron and I have already had the pleasure of doing a few presentations on this book in the mm -hmm. past. And it's always- And a video. Recently. And a video. That's mm -hmm. true. So we just filmed a video for APA that will come out in August. So the main reason why we wanted to put together a book series on skill building exercises or the lower practice has to do with this difference between conceptual learning and procedural learning conceptual learning, meaning the type of learning that we do when we read books, we attend lectures or we hear other people talk, we uh, listen to podcasts, we go to classes, we even watch therapy videos. All those are really great ways of learning theory, aka conceptual learning, right? So conceptual learning helps you think and reflect and discuss clinical topics in our case. What's often missing in a lot of training programs is the flip side of that, which is procedural learning, the learning by doing, right? So often in our field, there's a big gap in which we feel, uh, I think a lot of trainees actually say uh, some sort of imposter syndrome and trainees and therapists where they can talk really good about therapy, but then they don't feel as confident in their own therapy skills. There's actually a, a third type of learning that's kind of implicit here, which we may call conditional learning, which is when to do what. And I think actually EFT is wonderful for the conditional learning part as well, because they do a lot of marker-based interventions. When the client shows this marker, it's probabilistically better to go in this direction as a clinician. So the point is, there, there's a lot of resources for therapists to do conceptual learning, but not many resources to increase their procedural skills, to actually train repeatedly on their skills. It's kind of like you want to become a better piano player, but there's no lessons on how to actually tra practice the piano. There's only books on uh, the history of the piano or history of music. I mean, very interesting, but not going to make you a great piano player. So I guess that's the first question I want to jump in and ask Rhonda is how is this distinction and deliberate practice as a training method relevant for emotion focused therapy and those wanting to learn it? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so really huge. <laughs> I mean, one thing I want to say is that, and I've 
Alex and I have had, you know, of course, in the, this whole process of writing this book and then doing this video together recently, we have had multiple conversations about this. Um, and that, and, you know, it's very interesting because Alex approached me about this deliberate practice from the beginning. And we did the first book together, like in this series that now you've gone and done all these different books. Um, and I was very skeptical, right? Like we, we have to tell people that, that I was very skeptical. And I was skeptical partially because I think the whole concept of, of deliberate practice coming up from a behavioral kind of conditioning, like there's certain even buzzwords that I'm a bit allergic to, like like conditioning and... and um, Behavioral rehearsal. Behavioral <laughs> rehearsal, yeah. Like Yuck. that. So I, I was like, uh, no. So, um, but if you, t but the idea of procedural knowledge versus conceptual knowledge, right? Like, I feel like that made a lot of sense to me. And, and that EFT is actually has, you know, coming out of this humanistic experiential tradition. And I was trained and I read about this in the book, but I was trained by Laura Rice and then Les Greenberg. And we always put so much emphasis on like, and like, I'd go to supervision with Les, and now I'm like this with my students, of course, but I'd go to supervision with Les and he'd say like, put on the tape, put on the tape. Like I, I would be talking, talking, talking about, this is what happens, that's what happens, put on the tape, just put it on, right? Like he didn't even wanna engage in that conversation with me. <laughs> because then we know that what actually happens in the therapy session versus, you know, talking about it is completely different stuff. Right. So then it would be a lot based in actual listening to tapes. And then like and what I do with Laura and Laura was really she people don't know Laura Rice as well as they do Les Greenberg, I guess, at this point. But but Laura Rice, you know, she was this she was a student of Rogers. She was Les's mentor initially. And and she was really strong on empathy. And so she's really taught me empathy. And um, and so she would stop the tape, and like I'd play her a tape and she'd stop the tape and she'd be like, okay, so what was the client saying here? And I'd be like, uh, like, you know, I don't know, I know there's something that she wants to hear, but I don't know what it is. And I'd get very anxious. Okay, so I kind of grew up in this tradition of, of really learning by doing, right? And so this made a lot of sense from that perspective. And, and then the idea, and then I watched you guys, I watched you and Tony doing some demonstrations and, and like you see that supervisees really need this because otherwise like you can teach them brilliantly like what an empathic conjecture is, but they don't do it. Cause you know, you have that experience as a supervisor too. Like you, I told you to do this. And then like, how come you're not doing it right now, right? And that's because they have a maybe a conceptual understanding, but they don't, they, they have, they, it's not been committed to procedural knowledge and they don't, they don't know what to do when. That's another important thing you brought that up, Alex. And also um, they get anxious, right? Like they get anxious that they're not gonna know, how, they're gonna do it badly, right? I think. So there's all these pieces. So the idea of, if you work with students and your supervisees and people, training people um, to be able to say, okay, stop the tape here. What, A, what, are the, what is the client saying? B, this is the thing that you've really hit, like pushed, pushed more, even more Alex, I think that the deliberate practice is pushed, is having them do it. Like, like cause I would have before this said, play me a tape like I said, because of my training, I would have said, okay, this is what I think the client is saying here. Or I'd ask the trainee, what is the client saying here? But then I wouldn't say, okay, now, can you give an example of an empathic conjecture, nice. for example? And that's what I see how important that is. So I've come back around, haven't I? Like to this behavioral <laughs> thing <laughs> that, that behavioral, like the action is really important. And that repeating it right. many times is important in terms of committing it to procedural knowledge. So, so yeah, yeah that's, that's a little bit about my journey. <laughs>
I love you telling that story because I, I really love you being very upfront. I've always encouraged you to talk about the skepticism around this because yeah. I think those are really valid mm -hmm. skepticisms in doing this mm -hmm. project of the world practice in EFT. I mean, it's mm -hmm. easy to kind of find a way to rationalize around this. You can say instead of being behavioral, it's like experiential and using mm -hmm. body, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to get your body into it instead of just thinking yeah. about it, right? So you learned this early on with me, Alex. Of course, you have to adapt <laughs> to the audience you're working with, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm working with the DBT book, it's radical behaviorism. <laughs> so it's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So okay, so we did this um this book, and as part of it, you had the Herculean task of picking mm -hmm. out 12 mm -hmm. skills. Uh, that would uh, be a primer for starting out uh, learning EFT skills. Now, of course, this is not comprehensive. No one will come out of practicing these 12 skills knowing how to do EFT, but it's a compliment to people reading about EFT, seeing tapes of EFT. Can you speak a little bit as we look at this list of the 12 exercises that comprise the book? What was your thought process behind choosing these skills? Yeah, so couple of things. First of all, you can, if you do a quick scan, you see that five of the 12, which is almost half, are empathic skills. So obviously a lot of what the emotional focus therapist does is this kind of moment by moment, empathic exploration and deepening of emotion, right? And how do you do that? You do that a lot with empathic responding. Um, people in other traditions are not as trained towards all these different types of empathic, uh, we can call them skills, but empathic responding of the, of the therapist, right? In terms of deepening emotions. There's also this number four, which is exploratory questions, which is another way to deepen or get a deeper emotion. But I think the, the kind of predominance of empathic responding here is pretty important. Um, there's two skills that we talked about a lot, Alex, um, of therapist self-awareness and staying in the content, staying in contact in the face of intense affect. And um, we were trying to capture that there is a process inside of the therapist that is also really important in being able to do this kind of therapy. And although we found that this is difficult to, perhaps to measure and so, but that's just interesting that it's there. There's also the um, providing the treatment rationale for EFT, which we also understood from doing, you know, because we piloted a lot of these skills with people and we'd ha have them try them. And that was the feedback. People would come back after that exercise and say, oh, I learned what EFT was by doing this skill, right? So that was like huge. That was interesting for me because like, I think it's in my head, it's so obvious this is what EFT is. But like, if you're not used to it, then you don't know, right? So, so saying that is really important. Um, and then you took off the screen, right? Oh, sorry, yeah, we want um, to, let me put it back. Okay, and then, um, yeah, I guess, okay, so there's two more things things to say here. I mean, I could go on obviously a lot longer, but um, number 11, marker recognition and chair work task setup was our one nod <laughs> to tasks. And because tasks are hugely important in EFT and there's actually, if you're familiar with EFT, you know, there's many, many tasks. And that, but one thing you can say for sure is that all the tasks have markers associated with them and that therapists are trained to recognize markers and then facilitate the task. We couldn't possibly do all the tasks here. And that's why you said what you said at the beginning, but the idea of some of the key tasks and their markers, being able to recognize them as a starting point. And then there's exercise number 12, which is addressing ruptures and facilitating repair. So, and then that's something that we're gonna focus on today, right? Yeah. All treatment models, and you have all those books up there. I'm assuming you're still following that, that all the therapists, all therapist models, all therapeutic models have to have this, right? How do you and your model address ruptures and facilitate repair? And there's a specific way that you do that. So that's what we're going to focus on today.
Great, thank you. So one thing I want to point out, two things. First is a lot of these skills, as you look at the titles, empathic understanding, empathic evocations, they may make sense to a lot of people uh, who are with us today, but often these skills are described in very broad terms that are not really, um, they're too broad for skill building, for skills practice, right? So if you say, well, we should do an empathic understanding, a lot of trainees will nod saying, sure, but they don't really know what that means, right? So part of the, the job that you did, and I want to point this out because Rhonda had a lot of work <laughs> done in this, is being able to decompose each of these skills into observable therapist behaviors, mm -hmm. practicable therapist behaviors. Because one of the plagues in our field is that a lot of the theory building we have in our field is great for theory development and research purposes, but not great for skill building purposes. So when we study the therapeutic alliance and when we study empathic understanding, all these kind of things, the closest we have in our field to something that then we can take and practice as actual clinicians are things like maybe coding competency scales. Like those are sometimes more at the level of like clinician behaviors we can hold on mm -hmm. to and practice. But most of the time, these things aren't discussed at the level of like, what's the principle underlying the skill that you can practice. So that's the first thing that, you know, was a lot of work and kudos to Rhonda for being able to, to translate these skills into those observable clinician behaviors. And second, it's very interesting that these skills can be used in this book, can be used, um, you know, with a training partner, because there's a lot of client statements and you can role play with your training partner and, and get better and better over time. And we'll, we'll show you one of these exercises and how that looks. But I also want to mention, and Rhonda, I haven't had the chance to tell you this as well. Most recently, mm -hmm. I've had a couple of trainees across different countries saying that they love using these exercises with their own client videos. So they'll okay. be watching yeah. videos with their clients and they'll be like, I'm yeah. going to try with my video, working with my real client, I'm going to try mm -hmm. doing an empathic exploration using the criteria mm -hmm. from this book. Mm -hmm. Or even better, I'm going to try to stay in contact in the face of intense affect, use those criteria with the video mm -hmm. that I have with my real mm -hmm. client. So you can really yeah. use those criteria. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Purposes. So yeah, you already mentioned for today, we're going to give people a taste of a skill building door practice exercise in EFT. And you chose for us to focus on the last of these, which is <laughs> addressing <laughs> ruptures and facilitating repair. Mm -hmm. You want to say mm -hmm. a little bit just about this skill in the context of EFT? Uh, yeah. Okay. So in EFT, right. So we're very much about like staying in contact. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even though there sometimes is intense affect. Um, but also, um, you know, this kind of idea of presence, bringing your therapeutic presence and immediacy, staying in contact in the here and now, um, those are really important aspects, even when, and obviously when there's ruptures, it can be more challenging to do that because sometimes their clients may be confronting you or they may, <clears throat> not be confronting you, but still acting in a way that's yeah. difficult for you. Um, so the idea of therapist taking the lead and being um, very active in communicating their presence and their immediacy and staying in contact, speaking from your own experience, your own maybe primary emotion rather than, you know, secondary reactive, um, all of that's really important in addressing ruptures and then, you know, making sure to explore what it is for the client um, rather than like get into talking about, well, this is why I said that, or that's why I said, right. The, the therapist could easily get into defending themselves yeah. and explaining, or, you know, so how do you stay in contact and share of yourself in such a way that you don't, um, kind of push the client further away or and and that you sort of adequately explore their perspective and the impact of what you're saying back on them so yeah. all of that 
Yeah. So what was clear, I think, going into this exercise, when we saw a marker mm -hmm. of a rupture from a client, we knew that we wanted to train trainees to first not avoid talking about the rupture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And not try to convince the client of anything, right? So if the, the client is saying that this therapy isn't working for them, then you, as a trainee, you might feel a pull to try to convince them, well, but actually we've been doing a lot of great work, mm -hmm. blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. training this repeatedly actually goes in the opposite direction, kind of rolling with the resistance, if you want to use that expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So totally. Let's look at the criteria that you set up for this exercise. And these are this is a free criteria exercise, mm -hmm. meaning that when you're practicing this skill, you're trying to do these three things, all three of them, in mm -hmm. your therapist response. I'll mm -hmm. say from the get-go that a lot of trainees find it helpful to practice like this in chunks because it is sometimes hard to just do the first criteria. So if you find yeah. it hard for you or your trainees to practice all three at a time, chunk it down, right? But so a good uh, uh, EFT repair, rupture repair intervention would start with the therapist by expressing appreciation for the client's disclosure and validating their experience. Then the therapist conveys willingness to discuss their own role in contributing to the rupture. And finally, the therapist invites the client to discuss the experience of the rupture and how best to move forward, right? So again, exactly what you said, Rhonda, we kind of want to approach it, validate it, explore it, right? Instead of avoiding or convincing the client of something, right? It's interesting that what you just did, Alex, because you just did one, two, three, approach, mm -hmm. validate, explore. Like you could actually have one word for each one of those criteria. Yeah. That's pretty much. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's for uh, the edition number two of this book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We always end up writing the second edition as when we meet these days. <laughs> Every okay. time we look at the book, we find new revisions. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's look at an example of this. So let's imagine these are pre-scripted <laughs> client statements, right? So this is very important. In the practice, we want to provide a context where the stimuli, another word that Rhonda might not like, <laughs> the stimuli. <laughs> I'm getting is, used to it. <laughs> is always the same. I'm so. approaching rather than avoiding. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Habituation. <laughs> exactly. So, when the client is always saying the same thing, which of course doesn't happen in real clinical practice, then the therapist mm -hmm. has kind of a playground where they can experiment and improvise a lot of different times the same intervention and refine their intervention over time, right? So let's imagine if one trainee is playing the client, they would be reading this client statement you have here, and they could be reading the same client statement five times to give mm -hmm. the therapist a lot of opportunities to practice repeatedly the same skill, right? So in this example, let's imagine the client says, We've been meeting for a few months, but I'm honestly not feeling any better. I think maybe I'm doing therapy wrong. What do you think? Right? So this would be conceptualized as a form of rupture. They're saying they're discouraged about therapy. Now let's see what the therapist responds that meets the three criteria. Therapist says, I'm so glad you are bringing this up so we can discuss it. And I'm sorry you have not been feeling any better. So this meets criteria one, expressing appreciation for the client's disclosure and validating their experience. They continue by saying, I want to let you know that I don't think there's any such thing as doing therapy wrong. Maybe there's something in the way I work that we can change to better suit your needs. So that's conveying willingness to discuss the, your own role as a therapist in contributing to the rupture. Finally, can you tell me more about how you're feeling about our work here and any sense of what we could do, be doing differently? And that's criteria three, inviting the client to discuss their experience of the rupture and how to best move forward. Now, to meet all these three criteria, maybe you need a couple of repetitions. Maybe for earlier mm -hmm. trainees, they'll be practicing again and again, just the first piece, expressing appreciation for the client, right? So... It's and every exercise in the book has criteria that are very clear and that you can practice. Every exercise in the book has a lot of client statements that you can use for practice. And importantly, every exercise in the book has a lot of ter example therapist responses written by Rhonda 
to give a sense of what an EFT therapist might say in response to the client statement. Mm -hmm. So I thought we could do something fun. As part of our APA video that's going to come out in August, we were able to record some videos with actors playing the client statements that Rhonda wrote for this book. So we actually have uh, videos of an actor playing exactly these uh, uh, client statements for this particular exercise of repairing and ruptures. So what I'm going to suggest is that we actually do a practice together. Um, I was going to say, like, I, I've been working with this skill a little bit with my students, and I do feel like it's quite a, quite a complex one, yeah. um, especially, the, like, not all the skills have this much complexity in terms of one, two, three, like a lot of them have d at least three criteria, right? But um, I still feel like this one, those three are all important and yeah. they're all quite different. <laughs> and, yeah. and so for a student to have to kind of hit all the elements, it's quite difficult. I'm, I'm seeing that now, just observing my students trying to learn this. Yeah. And so... What I suggest, right? So th there's these sample therapist responses that Alex is saying that are in the book. And so sometimes with my students, they want those. And then they actually want to really like study that therapist response and then try to, in their own words, do it. In other cases, they're like, oh, no, no, I don't need it at all. I don't need the therapist prompts. I just want to go free form. I'm going to improvise right off the top. So I guess if you're working with your supervisees or students, it's important to sort of modulate every exercise to the trainee themselves. So, yeah, yeah I just wanted to say that. Yeah. So you can, and, and I think we've designed the books and I don't know how you've done your other books as well, obviously, mm -hmm. but we've designed the books so you can play with this, right? Like you can use our responses or improvise. And that's going to probably depend on also how confident and experienced the trainee feels. Yeah, yeah, great point, yeah. So I'm wondering if anyone feels up to trying this out. We promise that, you know, Rhonda has a very compassionate feedback policy. <laughs> She's very warm in giving her corrective feedback. So would anyone want to try, you can raise your hand or write on the chat, want to try out improvising a therapist response to this? All right, response? Jeff. All right. Okay. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Great. So you want to you wanna say who you are and where you're calling from, Jeff, so everyone gets to know you? Hey, uh, my name is um, Jeff Harris. I'm in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I know Rhonda and Alex from CEPI, so I feel a little more comfortable jumping in. Um, but I'm an experiential learner, so I'm going to jump in the deep end. And Yay. Right. Dog, dog paddle across the pool. Thank you. Okay. Well, and I want to say, Jeff, for your benefit, but for everyone else's as well, the purpose of the little practice is getting it wrong. You won't learn anything mm -hmm. if you get it right. So we actually hope that like you feel you're getting stretched a little bit. And because in our culture of psychotherapy, we have this sense of like, I have to prove my competency, which is great maybe for certain scenarios, but not so much for learning. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. you stepping up. And yeah, Honda, Rhonda, I'm sure we'll give you some cool feedback. Mm-hmm. All right. Are you ready to see our client statement? Okay. Let me just read yeah. through these. Express uh, so let me let me say what yeah. I think these means out loud before I say yeah, it. That's Go for it. Okay. Great. Okay. Express appreciation for clients disclosure and validate their experience. So that's the I know it's hard to bring up these problems. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, you know, can convey willingness to discuss your own role in contributing to the rupture. I would say, I might say something like, um, mm -hmm. our discussions in here are, are, are complicated. So I, I'm sure that I sometimes do things that aren't helpful to you. And I'm glad we're talking about that. And then, um, tell, so based on that, I'd like, so we invite client to discuss the experiences. Tell me a little bit about where I might have misstepped and where I might have um stepped on your toes or something like that you got it yeah so yeah so yeah, I, I guess good. when i said those out loud i realized that i'm using some colloquial language like stepping on your toes to say this 
this is a complicated thing and I don't think there's any perfect way. So I think that's a great way to do it. You got the gist of it and I just need to apply it to this specific client statement. That's a great way to go about it. Yeah, okay. So the, that's all really, I, I love that um, summary basically that you did of each of the criteria. So let me just emphasize a few points. So in number one, this expression of appreciation is important. Like it's, and validation, right? Like it's, you you said all of that, but just to, I just want to emphasize like that you really want, you're really appreciative. Like you really know how hard it is for somebody to bring this up. And, you know, one thing that the EFT therapist is always doing is thinking about how does whatever the person's presenting to me make sense, right? So I really want, and then my I base my validation off of that, right? Like, oh, so yeah, like that makes so much sense. You feel this way kind of thing. So and that's it fits an in with what we already know about one another. Exactly. Okay. And then I think you appropriately signal the number two, this importance of like you're saying, I'm taking some responsibility for um, something, whatever's happened, and we have to see what that is. But I know that I may have had a role in that. And that's an important thing. And then number three, which is the, I was just thinking and when I was listening to you talk is that it's unclear when we say how to best move forward, but it's because it's dependent on what the client is bringing and that the therapist needs to sort of sort through what that's gonna look like based on what the client is bringing to them. So, yeah, yeah. All right. Without further ado, let's try it. All right. I just have a feeling that you aren't really interested in. Sometimes you seem bored and tired. Please, if this is really true, just be honest and tell me. All right, Chef. Can I, can you give me the client and can we have the client have a name? Yeah, let's call her Selma and let's do it Selma. again. Let me, let me just, let's do it one more time. Does that help? Okay. I just have the feeling that you aren't really interested in. Sometimes you seem bored and tired. Please, if this is really true, just be honest and tell me. So I want, I want to thank you for expressing your concerns. I know that it's, it's hard sometimes to tell people when, when they may have done something that wasn't helpful. So I appreciate you sharing your concerns. Um, I want to start by saying that there are, I, I think I'm, I'm happy to admit that sometimes I'm tired. I've been going, I, I and sometimes I'm not at my best. So I think it's important for us to explore this. And, and I know, and so I will do my best to be honest with you. So I want you to tell me more about how, how when it seems like I'm not interested or seems that I'm, I'm tired or bored, how that impacts you. And then I wanna be able to talk about how we can resolve that so that I can be helpful to you. All right. All right. Excellent. You're Thanks. you're a, you're an expert therapist, I think. <laughs> I, I, I've had a little bit of experience. Uh huh. Okay. I thought that was pretty good in terms of hitting all the elements, right? Um. <clears throat> so you really acknowledged, you took responsibility, and then you sort of inv invited her to go to move forward. So I think all the basic elements are there. Um, I, I, I was listening, um, for myself to like what I would, and I think also like what I was thinking as, oh gosh, if a client felt that I was, that I was bored, right? Oh, and I really, by the way, I really like that you said, I want to take responsibility for being tired. I forgot to say that. So, okay. But and I figured um, it was better to say you know, the confess what, you know, what to confess that 
it's better yeah. to be tired than bored. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, but I think it does go to the question of like, to what extent are you therapists going to disclose whatever you're feeling? Or that if you're feeling something, are you going to say it? Or are you going to, right? So I think that's an important thing. And this allows you to kind of play with that and see what you're going to do. But I think I agree with you. It's better to say, um, but you also have to be genuine and accurate, right? Like the clients know when you're not telling. So I think um, like you could say, I, I understand how you could think that because I have been really tired lately and and maybe that's coming across more than I realized right and then you could even say one step further like but I want to just let you know that I'm not bored right I have not been bored with what you're telling me um so I think that was what I was going to say is just like to what extent am I going to confirm or deny <laughs> and but Certainly address is the key thing. Like you have right. to somehow address that, right? Um, I certainly and, felt yeah. initially that defensiveness, like I'm not bored. No, I'm not, you know, so yeah. so that was the, you know, and that with any rupture, you know, the, the, my defense comes up. So, sure. so I think that this was good practice to say, I need to, you know, I need to yeah. have that willingness the only other thing I might also add, though, would be um, sort of saying like, oh, that must be something about how that must be hard for you. Like if I was a client, I would feel like I would feel good if my therapist said like, oh, you know, I'm really sorry that you feel that right? Like, because that must be difficult. So so maybe a little bit like just turning up the volume a little bit more on that. Yep. Um, but otherwise, like I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. And yeah, and then that's that empathic self-disclosure where I'm saying mm -hmm. when you told me that you thought I might not be interested, that that makes me sad because I know it's yeah. important that we maintain that connection. Yeah. You could up that a little bit, like in terms of how you feel and how it impacted you, because that's helpful to them. Right. And and the when we talk about a rupture, it's it's on both sides you know i'm trying to stay connected to you selma and so it's yeah disappointing to me that i didn't maintain that connection and so the rupture is is hurtful to me as well if i may yeah do, exactly yeah. if i may do a Go process ahead. comment also because what we're mm -hmm. seeing here is something that we see in both the lower practice with these kind of pre-scripted exercises but also when we apply the lower mm -hmm. practice in individual supervision with more experienced therapists like Jeff, because they quickly can grab onto the basic criteria and do a really good response almost from the get-go, it's mm -hmm. easier that, well, first of all, the temptation is to only give positive feedback, right? So mm -hmm. as supervisors mm -hmm. and teachers, we have to be careful because only mm -hmm. giving positive feedback actually doesn't help. You don't learn mm -hmm. anything by just getting positive feedback. Mm -hmm. So I can see, Rhonda, you're really trying hard and I really appreciate finding specific <laughs> things to give corrective mm -hmm. feedback, which is really important. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when you're working with more experienced clinicians, your feedback will be probably very nuanced, like just suggesting, just try this little thing different, right? Yeah. yeah. Or you might even focus yeah. on nonverbals because if Jeff is nailing the content really well, yeah. you might say, you want to do that again just for verbal fluency, to try to get at the same message with less words, for example, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a thing that we see again and again. Now, with some trainees, you might try out this exercise and they will just freeze after the client's statement. And we've seen that a lot. Absolutely. Tests, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, um, and then, like, and I, because I've been working with my first year students more recently doing some of these pretty complex skills. And they're like, and I'm seeing that, like, they're freezing. And, but then I just, they, and they just like play it again, just go right, do it again. Right. And they want to complete redo. Okay. I let them do it. You know, it's just. Right. Yeah. Jeff, are you up for one more? Sure. <clears throat> Doing great. All right. So let's just do this, this last one here. <clears throat> I'll play it two times. So you have a good sense. Of it. Oh, thank you. And what's her, can you give her name too? Yeah, this would be Sarah. Sarah. Thank you. I really don't think that this therapy is working for me. 
every week I just come back and I tell you the same thing over and over again and I just don't feel we are making any progress. To be honest, I feel like I'm wasting my time and your time. All right, I'll play it one more time. I really don't think that this therapy is working for me. Every week I just come back and I tell you the same thing over and over again. And I just don't feel we are making any progress. To be honest, I feel like I'm wasting my time and your time. Kira, I want to I want to thank you for telling me that you feel like we're a little bit stuck and that that things aren't working. I want um I want to explore this a little bit more and I want to acknowledge that there may be things that I'm doing that aren't helping you um get out of this place where you're telling the same thing and moving forward. So I I think it's important that we discuss your experience that we're not making progress, but but definitely I don't feel like you're wasting my time. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanna see if we can move forward or, or if, but if, if this isn't working for you, I'm going to acknowledge that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So um, I think again, I, you hit all the elements of the criteria, right? Um, if we say like, you know, approach, validate, uh, take some responsibility, share something of yourself, and then like suggest a path for moving forward. The only thing I would <clears throat> add again is the degree of um, validation and maybe empathy, like we call that empathy. So like just saying, you know, I am sorry that you're feeling so stuck, right? And, and that must be hard to feel like you're spinning your wheels. I might even give like a kind of a metaphor, empathic metaphor of what it feels, trying to capture something of the experience that she's saying. This is hard, like, cause actually she's um, more angry in this. Well, no, the other one was a bit angry too, but it's hard. Like these are good examples because clients are saying like, I'm, you know, you're just, you know, I'm just wasting my time and your time. I mean, that's tough, right? Like, that's not easy, no, right? You're, yeah. you're, yeah. So yeah, there's I think some fear there. Like, maybe I'm not as good to, as I think I could. Yeah, yeah. And the tendency is to want to just like pull back or, you know, freeze or yourself. Or, <laughs> so, so like, but then it's almost like action opposite action. Okay, I'm going to move forward, right? Rather than backward. And then like, but then like imagining what it's like to be this person who's feeling this, even in the face of the confrontation. And so she feels so stuck oh, and she feels like she's wasting your time and her time. So that must be quite a difficult experience. So I think like really adding the empathy piece in your statement to it and everything else as well. Um, also, maybe you could just do it in less words, but that's um, that takes like we'd have to practice over. And I see it's not it doesn't totally mirror what would probably happen in real life. You probably wouldn't use that many words. I would but, have an outline with three bullet points. <laughs> you wouldn't have that either, right? It yeah, and I yeah. might just start with that. And I think, and and you can help me, Rhonda. You know, so I think of empathy as being more connected mm -hmm. and less content. So it's weird to be the empathic and hit three bullet points, <laughs> you know. It's a lot, yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. And it may be, okay, so here's a good question for both, both Ron and Alex. So for those three bullet points, do I have to do those in one statement or could I do those in three consecutive statements with the client's feedback in between? The, Sorry, I was reading the chat, but go ahead, Alex, answer because I didn't totally hear the question. Yeah, yeah. The, the trick with uh, trying to move into a free-form role play where you get feedback from the person playing the client right. <laughs> is you don't know the direction that they're going to go into. So what we found very early on that if we left uh, 
it up to the person playing the client to role play in any way, you could not have like a standardized model where people could practice repeatedly. So I would encourage still now, if you feel like, you know, what I really want out of these three things, what I really want to practice most is criteria one and two, feel free to just repeat those, right? And hone in on those. So uh, to answer your question, but also kind of uh, add a piece uh, to this for everyone watching, the thing that you're not seeing that's very important in the lower practice is the repetition element, right? We're not demonstrating that now for time reasons, but if you're working with a trainee, yeah, what, yeah. like for example, Rhonda's feedback to be kind of mm -hmm. very focused on very specific things that Jeff could try again and do differently mm -hmm. and quickly jump back to practice to try it again, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that every time our mouth as supervisors or trainer is talking, the trainees might be learning something conceptually, but they're not practicing a skill, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, my colleague Tony likes to say that gravity is always pulling us away from rehearsal. So it's very tempting for us to go off in rants even during practicing these skills. And it's kind of a discipline for both the trainee and the trainer to kind of go back to the skill and practice repeatedly. But we That's found that, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very important because every time you practice, you find out more things about yourself, your own limits, you refine it over time. So just something yeah. to keep in mind, right? And for those watching, you can use this process with these exercises and you could be practicing the same skill over and over and over and be refining it over time, right? Completely. So I want to just address a question Stacy's asking. Um, and maybe Stacy, you want to just say a little bit more about your question because I, I think it's interesting. Um, but you're saying, um, can you take, can you suggest how to take responsibility for a role in Sarah's sense of stuffness? I think we don't know yet. We know she feels stuck. Um, and we want to name that and validate that she feels that. I think we also want to say, you know, I'm sorry that you're feeling that way. Um, you can, and as Jeff did signal, um, you know, I haven't been feeling like my time has been wasted, but you certainly do feel like that. And I want to know more about that. Right. So, so, um, I think that's the way I would approach it. I'd begin to sort of approach it and start to unpack it a little bit and elaborate it. But from the place of thinking about it as stuckness rather than wasting of time, maybe that like I might ref I'm reframing right there by calling it stuckness. I'm reframing it a little bit because waste of time to me sounds a little bit more, um, you know, difficult and that you as therapists could get like kind of caught up in that. So I would go more to, can we talk more about this feeling of stuckness? I'm sorry, you know, but really signaling at the same time that I'm wanting to talk more about that. Um, so what was your, do you have ideas about, is, is, does that answer your question? And did you have a certain idea when you wrote that? In the uh, chat? That was a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, my first sense was gulp, you know? Yeah, have, yeah. Uh, have a, a client say that to you when you've been, you know, working so hard and, you know, and maybe that's part of it too. Like maybe I, I'm working a little bit harder here. Not that I would necessarily share that with a client, but something that I would certainly take out of that session with me to explore a little bit more deeply. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you for that comment about kind of reframing that sense of frustration, almost verging on expressing as anger into a sense yeah. of stuckness. You're feeling really stuck here. Like what can we do together yeah. to get unstuck? Yeah. And I, I loved yeah. what Jeff said about like, maybe I think you were sort of intimating, like maybe it's just not a good fit and that's okay too, but I am here for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, this is like so tempting uh, to keep on going, right? Because there's so much stuff. Rhonda, you wanted to answer? Well, I just was going to say, like, I sometimes I notice that other people have, I think it's good to give clients that feeling of you don't have to continue if you don't want to continue with me. I'm not going to force it. But at the same time, I don't think I'd say this, let's not continue if this isn't a good fit, because that almost opens the door in a way that I wouldn't want to open. <laughs> so, so that's just a slight difference. And that might just be a personal thing of that different approaches. And yeah. yeah. Well, I'll just view us back again. So 
I hope everyone got a mm -hmm. sense for what a dolor of practice is in the context of EFT. So there are 12 of these <laughs> in the book, uh, dolor of practice, mm -hmm. emotion focus therapy. Even if mm -hmm. you don't get the book, which you definitely should, uh, mm -hmm. the, thing, the thing to come out from this webinar is that there is a really big difference thinking about these things and thinking about skills, thinking about what mm -hmm. you say to a client versus actually saying it and experimenting with it, right? Because often we are much more eloquent in our mind than when we open our yeah. mouths. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of students might feel the same way, right? Students, trainees, therapists that, well, I know how to do that. And then when you actually yeah. do it, it comes off, you know, a little bit differently than we assumed, right? So I want yeah. to all thank Jeff so much for the courage and the great yeah. the contribution. That was really great, Jeff. Thank you so much. Jeff, yeah, you're amazing. Thank you so much for yeah. uh, jumping in like that. Yeah. I want, I want to thank Rhonda again, not just for today, but all the work she put into this. And also, like we mentioned before, we filmed recently uh, a DVD to accompany this book that will come out in August, mm -hmm. where we're showing real door practice with two real trainees who have never practiced these skills so that was pretty mm -hmm. fun and you have mm -hmm. more of those video prompts that jeff just used for practicing those are will also be included in the dvd to have a lot of client mm -hmm. videos to work from and let's see we have some more stuff here on the chat and if you want um any more training in eft i mean some people i know i recognize some of the people here but i'm just going to write my um email in the chat just um because we have ongoing training i'll do the same great yeah so our emails will be on the chat over here if we love to answer emails so feel free to drop by if you have mm -hmm. any further input especially if you try mm -hmm. stuff that work and doesn't work that really helps us as well mm -hmm. And yeah, just the last nod. So if you want more of these kind of webinars and trainings for supervisors and tra trainings for mm -hmm. supervisors and trainers, feel free to go to our website at sentiocc.org. Mm -hmm. Also the International Emotion Focus Therapy uh, Society. Uh, mm -hmm. How should I say it, Rhonda? ISF.org. ISF.org. Let's put that on the chat. I'll put well. that in the chat as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to everyone. I want to respect everyone's time. We're almost out of time for today, but thank you yeah. for everyone. And yeah, our emails are in the chat if you want to continue the conversation. And yeah, thanks all. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Alex, too, for all your work on deliberate practice. Amazing. Mm -hmm.